ओके गुड इवनिंग एवरी वन हूज इन द ऑडियंस टूडे माई नेम इज प्रोफेसर प्रकाश वी मलिया आई एम बेसिकली अ फार्मसी मैन फ्रॉम द फार्मास्यूटिकल इंडस्ट्री आई एम सीनियर सिटीजन एंड सिक्सटी एट ईयर्स ओल्ड एंड आई स्पेंड अराउंड फोर्टी ईयर्स इन द इंडस्ट्री एंड एकेडेमिक्स प्रेजेंटली आई एम द director and professor in krupadevi college of pharmacy in bangalore i have 35 years of experience in the pharma industry and 10 years last 10 years i have come to academics to be with the young budding pharmacists and youngsters in our university i did my pharmacy from manipal college of pharmacy in manipal everybody knows that university and then i went to usa to do my masters and completed my master of science that is ms in pharmaceutical sciences i had three years work experience in us and then came back to india and uh, joined dr reddy's labs uh, everybody knows about dr reddy's labs in hyderabad and then to other big uh, pharmaceutical industries like arbindo pharma and uh, matco i have us experience as well as in the last before coming to the academics i was in the gulf country uh, working for a gulf pharmaceutical organization called oman pharma zainova so i have a good balance of uh, industry plus academic uh, teaching and uh, therefore i i felt that i could take up a subject uh, which is very much in demand and uh, more so after the pandemic and the covid-19 situation which is occurring in our country unfortunately along the global pandemic so uh, i have uh, now come to uh, a conclusion that this particular topic on regulatory affairs is very much in demand in the industry as well as in teaching profession they have started newer uh, academic subjects called regulatory affairs both for the undergraduate as well as the post graduation and then there are some universities abroad in us and canada and australia and uh, uh, european countries where they have phd in regulatory affairs and as i have mentioned here this is a new world of knowledge so i am hopeful that i am going to interact with you in a very uh, positive way and you will be able to ask many questions on this before i start my presentation i'd like to make a disclaimer which is there in any of the you know uh, senior professionals like us who come to talk on a big forum like nptel uh i would say that the opinions and views expressed in this webinar slide presentation and discussion to follow are solely those of mine that is the presenter and not necessarily those of my college or any previous organizations i have worked in uh now we have come at a very uh, you know inflection point in our lives in all our lives because the situation outside is leading us to uncertain times as as is mentioned in this plaque here in uncertain times we are witnessing one of the greatest moments in the history of science why i'm saying the greatest moment in the history of science even though we know that the sickness and the exponential statistics of deaths and those who are infected is giving a, a depression sign but like many great people have said this is the opportune time which will change our future forever a good example is that of a digital environment around us this would have taken we have gone we would have gone from offline to online and to the digital technology and with all these online gadgets which are coming 
we would have in the normal times we would have taken it another 5 years or so before we can get it to the time when we are at the present now everybody seems to be very caught up in the digital environment most of the educated people and those who are in in the working class or in the academic and the teaching class they have a laptop a desktop a mobile phone a tablet a digital phone and various other digital gadgets we have gone into a greatest moment in science where there are lots of things which are going into the health sciences and the pharmaceutical sciences now besides the so many other things you see the talk for today is not about so many other uh, you know uh, technologies or so many other industries but it's typically about the pharmaceutical industry that is why i have given the title as pharmaceutical regulatory affairs so we are going into a great moments in the history of science by our procedures which are taking during this time for example just take an example of fighting the pandemic everybody knows what i mean when i say pandemic now if you see the type of developments which have taken in the last 4 or 5 months which never would have taken for the next 5 6 7 8 10 years in the diagnostic uh, area as you can see here uh this diagnostic you know uh, the ones which used to identify the positive cases the diagnostic test which you have there are 41 to 42 you see i'm just giving a shadow effect here to say that we are transiting this is not a fixed number as in the case here so in diagnostic we have 41 different kinds of kits which are available for fighting the pandemics the treatment in terms of drugs which are available for curing there are 24 or 25 never in the history so many by uh, you know lead molecules as they call it have come into the picture and scientists are working it round the clock in different parts of the world we have 23 to 24 the last count was around 26 so i'm still you know what every day the these keep numbers keep changing then in the vaccine can you believe to prevent future infection we have now 195 vaccines globally which are in various stages of discovery and development so you can see what are the sciences which we are shifting now and what are the things which we are learning in this new uh, era post covid or maybe it's not yet we are in the new normal now now say take this example day after day before yesterday this was the uh, one of the uh, news cuttings uh, from times of india how long before you can get a covid vaccine and here are the real numbers 142 in clinical in phase trials 14 in phase trials i am going to talk about this in my uh, lecture today uh, then we have nine in phase uh, phase 3 trials and then three have been approved but then we have little problems as you heard the news day before yesterday two of the drugs are on hold one is by that oxford another one is astrazeneca and third one is from or moderna all the three has been uh, kept on hold uh, because of uh, certain kind of side effects which some of the you know healthy volunteers and patients have taken this medicine so going back to the previous slide now again i say that this total works out to around 195 new molecules so you can see never in the history there used to be one or two or basically three or four vaccine but 195 so you can see what has happened when i put the first slide that so many changes have come about uh, in a positive way people are accelerating their discovery phases and development phases the government are supporting by funding and the regulatory authorities like the us fda 
and the UK MHRA and the European EMEA are all trying to support and uh, further this cause into action and fruition in getting the first vaccine. So uh, today I'm going to talk about the following points. One is the preamble, that is, what are the stages? And I know that audience co consists of young uh, uh, students, uh, scientists, some industry personnel. Uh, so my talk will be a little balanced between all those stakeholders in the audience. Uh, and uh, maybe in the question on ascension, I will take it uh, further uh, to make you uh, more understand. And then I would also understand in return how much you have understood what I have talked. So I'll be talking about preamble, the drug discovery and development, a little bit of history of regulation, how the regulatory affairs. See, this is the new science which came into uh, the global arena, the pharmaceutical arena, somewhere in the late 70s and early 80s. So regulatory affairs department itself was not existing, but then the uh, dealing with the regulatory authorities like FDA, they said that we need to have a regulatory affairs department in every ph pharmaceutical, nutraceutical, biotechnology companies, medical devices, things like that. So I'll talk a little bit of history because uh, it is better a little bit of hist historical knowledge you should know about what happened to our, uh, you know, uh, what happened in the past to come to this stage of such high, high, high throughput, uh, you know, medicines coming out one after the other. Then introduction to regulatory affairs. What would be the regulatory affairs uh, department? Uh, we'll talk about this. Uh, we'll talk about the justification for the regulatory affairs department. Why do we need a regulatory affairs department? Uh, and then we'll talk because there are young uh, students who are there and looking for career and opportunities in RA. By the way, RA means the short form for regulatory affairs. And then I'll give some of my conclusion as to what the future will look like. And of course, at the end will be the question answer. Now, uh, a small quiz, and I'm going to answer this quiz, but this is just for your knowledge. Uh, you can see from this slide where India is. India, as a statistics, is third in the entire world, in the global arena of pharmaceuticals. First one is US, second is uh, China, and third one is India. It's third in terms of the number of volumes of drugs which are coming out of India to the rest of the world. And that is why India is called as a laboratory of the world. So it is called as laboratory. So which of the country in the world have the following designations? Laboratory of the world, the country where medicines are most economical, the highest number of pharma organization in the world, and the big news, uh, at least not for the now, but in future, is which is the country which is the largest vaccine producer. No marks for guessing. One hint I already gave. Now that that country is India. So it, it's a, a very proud moment for India that besides many people in the audience who think that we are well known for IT, believe you me, now the best country to have the greatest number of uh, medicines to come out in future will be India. So India is going to uh, rule in the pharmaceutical arena and now with some kind of uh, strictures going on with the China, we will be able to, uh, as many things we were outsourcing to them and now we will have to again develop those things like the raw materials for tablets, capsules, injectables, uh, ointment, cream and all that back in India. So uh, there will be lots and lots of opportunities coming the way of those who, are, who have selected the pharmaceutical science as their life career. 
Now, a great uh, observation from one uh, top uh, global analyst and a consultant. He, he is in this field for the last 45 to 50 years. Uh, he has made a pertinent point uh, just a couple of years back. The Indian pharmaceutical industry is a success story, providing employment for millions and ensuring that essential drugs at affordable prices are available to the vast population of this subcontinent. Not only India, but the surrounding countries and for in fact the rest of the world are depending on India. Like I said, the four things which where India uh, uh, is well known, you know, laboratory of the world, the medicines are most economical, the highest number of pharma organization, and most of them have been recognized uh, in the highest regulatory standards of US, Europe, uh, Australia, Canada, Latin America. Uh, you know, so one of our trading big partners is Brazil. Russia is a big partner. So all these big countries are uh, now looking to India for this part now, the vaccine. So discovery will be somewhere else. But the production will be there. And you know of a famous company in Pune called as, uh, you know, Serum Institute. Then we have these Bharat Biotech in Hyderabad, which are doing all these. So India is going to shine in the future in the area of pharmaceuticals. If, like I said, I will touch upon certain things uh, very briefly. Uh, one of them is this. You don't have to know this in details. And if you have to know it, please, I will give you my uh, uh, contact details at the end of my lecture. And you can always write to me. You can always talk to me. And I'll, I'll be glad to explain you because now I'm a professor. I like teaching and I like interacting with youngsters. So uh, you can come back to me whenever you need me. So the history or the drug discovery you know, stage starts with the... In the initial stage, you know, lots of compounds and lots of molecules and initial ideas and leads are taken into the picture. And then comes many of them out of 10,000 compounds, only 200 compounds remain after about four or five years. So the total time is taken normally. It would have taken 15 years. But now the drug discovery trial has come down to 10 years. Then there are you know, compassionate ground uh, uh, reasons or there are some tragedies or like what has happened now where the regulatory, the government, the pharmaceutical company, the lawmakers, everybody comes into the picture to hasten up the thing because it's a national calamity and a national emergency. So out of 10,000, uh, you see only 250 compounds. Uh, which are finally at the stage of preclinical, what are called as animal studies. Then from that, imagine 245 gets eliminated, five compounds remain for clinical trials. Then the FDA review, this is uh, normally for the new drugs. Most of the countries look to US because they have got an advanced regulatory system and they have historically they have done a lot of for the last hundred or so years uh, and they review because wh what why is fda uh, uh, fda review important because it depends on the safety and efficacy so it depends on whether the drug is safe it is drug is effective for what it is used for so fda has got a huge data bank and a huge uh, lab and scientist who work for them day and night and see that if the drug is good, it finally comes into the picture. But it takes a long time. Now see a new drug development. Uh, among so many you know, drugs which are there initially in step one or stage one, finally when it comes to regulatory approval, only two or three remain because along the way, there is a lot of elimination due to various kinds of, uh, uh, you know, uh, scientific uh, uh, discussions which and documents which do not support the active drug indicate or the new drug molecule. So only a few remain at the end of the trial. 
And just to give you a brief timeline, again, it is the same funnel, what you call as the inverted funnel. So out of the five to 10,000 compounds in each history, only finally one or two comes to the market and finally reaches the patient. Because along the way, you see that it, it, is, it has to go through discovery, the preclinical testing, the testing in animals, uh, and then testing in humans, uh, and even the testing of human takes time. It has to go through three phases, uh, phase one, phase two, and phase three. Phase two and phase three, like we saw, what we saw in the current, uh, the three of the vaccines which are remaining, they are presently in stage three and they are about to be launched. So the final testing is still going on. The scientists are after that and they'll be coming out soon. So there will be an FDA review and uh, obviously because of the urgency of the vaccines trying to come out, they will be doing some kind of a cooperative uh, you know, alliance with the drug companies and try to release the molecule as soon as possible. So uh, as per the current status, the cost of launching a new molecule is in one to two billion. It means that one billion is equivalent to nearly about 8,000 crores. So nearly about 15 to 20,000 crores for coming out with one new drug like what is mentioned here or seen here in your slide. And it takes that many years. That is why when, when on the TV or on the newspaper or in, in colleges, when they discuss this, that why a drug is, why a vaccine cannot be developed, because normally it takes so many years, but everybody is trying to fast track so that the masses don't, you know, beneficial to the patient finally, and the death rate and the infection rate comes down once a vaccine is produced. So a new uh, product funnel <coughs> looks something like this, uh, just to give you a short uh, glimpse of this. It has to go through various funnel stages and screening stages. Finally, when a drug is launched and then it is on its way towards the journey of marketing and then availability at the various, uh, uh, you know, supply chain uh, network in the industry uh, and in the markets, in the distributor to stockists, to uh, retailers and finally to the hospital and patients. It goes through various kinds of stages and then it is on its way to a, a journey of, uh, you know, cure and wellness, health, wellness and cure. Despite of all these, you know, uh, uh, what you call as uh, stages for development with huge cost, from 2000 to 2020, nearly more than 5,000 new drugs were again recalled back and they did not see the light of the day. The famous drug recalls are there of these anti-arthritic anti drugs like salicoxib, rofecoxib by the brand name Viox. Then we had the anti-diabetic drugs called uh, gl glitazones. So various kinds of glitazone like paraglitazone and rosiglitazone they were recalled back. That means they cannot be into the market. In spite of so many years of travel through various kinds of uh, checkpoints and various kinds of you know, uh, animal and human studies, it still didn't work after so many years. And then it went back again to the huge jungle of uh, uh, molecules which were discarded. So, so many drugs, uh, in spite of uh, successful uh, initial approval, it went into uh, the waste paper basket, as you call it, or into the Bay of Bengal. Because why? Three important things were not defined properly during the stage, or even if it passed through, because it was done on small set of population, when it is launched globally, three of the things which could not stand to the scrutiny when it was used in larger population, that is safety, efficacy, and quality. The first two being very important, that is safety and efficacy. 
uh, quality is finally the responsibility of the manufacturer and the GMP standards or the good manufacturing standards that he adopts in his uh, plant or the manufacturing unit. The overriding factor for discovery of any molecule is patient protection is the priority. So that is why safety and efficacy, that is why you see the, you know, uh, the effects in the, in the, uh, as far as the vaccine discovery is concerned and why some of them had predicted that by July we will get one vaccine. Some said by August we'll get it. Now the nearest, uh, uh, you know, time points or the timeline is somewhere in uh, November, or maybe they don't. Say, they say it maybe in the first week of the new year. So which new year? Again, that will be uh, something which will be debated for uh, a long time. But anyway, the global effort is there to get this. That is why I, I told you a brief journey of what it takes. Finally, the FDA. Now, in this case, the FDA is the main one now because, like I said, the US FDA. FDA means Food and Drug Administration of the United States. It's located in Maryland. And they have huge laboratories, uh, not only in the US, but across the globe. They have to approve it. And they have to give an, uh, you know, marketing authorization uh, for it to be available. And then it will be distributed. So, like I said, a drug becomes a medicine. See, what we want is not a drug. We want medicine, okay, in the term of tablet, capsule, or vaccines. A drug becomes a medicine only when a product license is granted by the regulatory authorities. So until then, a drug cannot be used as a medicine until the final approval comes from the drug department of the Ministry of Health. In, in uh, the case of India, we have it in New Delhi called CDSCO. I'll define it when we come to that slide. A brief history on the regulation shows that there were major tragedies before see, it, the whole of the thing started from 1902. So the first of the regulations came in 1902. But along the journey, now we are in 2020, along so many years, there were major tragedies which defined the regulation and the regulatory affairs stronger and stronger. And each of these tragedies was associated with lots of deaths. Imagine in 1935, 1941, 1961, 62, and now we are in 2020. All these were defined by lots of people dying. Because in those, in those times, we know a rough figure, but we do not know the entire because data was not recorded in statistical manner or in chronological order. In 1935, a poisonous substance was used with what he called as an alcoholic mixture of sulfonylamide. Because uh, rules were not there on any kind of drug regulation, uh, so people were doing their own combination. Like what uh, nowadays we see on the roadside, you know, the jadi budi walas. They do any kind of combination and they capture the minds of the poor people and the gullible people who want quick recovery. And the Jadi Putyupalas on the streets do that. The same situation was occurring in leading countries. One of them being US. So these regulations started, the, the, you know, the main regulations in regular affairs started in USA. So in 2000, uh, in 1902, and the first of the major tragedies was recorded. We don't know how many tragedies occurred between 1902 and 1935 because it's not documented. Uh, first of the greater tragedies was when 107 people died because of this combination. So the first, uh, you know, uh, regulation, which I'll show you in the next class, uh, came into the picture from 1902 and in between, and then major ones, 1935. Then came the tragedy in 1941, where 300 and people died due to a combination of sulfathiazel contaminated with another antidepressant uh, called phenobarbital, and it was manufactured by so-and-so company. So uh, 300 people died. So what are these? 
every regulation and regulatory affairs became stronger and stronger due to tragedies. Then came the major tragedy from where the regulatory affairs and regulation did not look back. It only went from strength to strength. See, even though the historically it has more than 70, 80 years of its uh, uh, in existence, but still people continued to die. In 1961-62, we had the one of the very landmark and very well publicized tragedy called as the Thalidomide tragedy, wherein this active ingredient uh, was marketed in Europe. See, it was discovered by in uh, in a in a in a company in Germany, uh, and then this thalidomide was first marketed in Europe, and then it went to Australia. And uh, believe it or not, in US they did not approve of that because there was a strong lady at the head of uh, the ministry there. Uh, of FDA called as Francis Kaplan. And she prevented thalidomide tragedy by not approving the drug in US. So we have three major tragedies which have uh, happened here. And you saw this now here in the background, you can see the president of US of that time called John F. Kennedy. Uh, he, he, in 1962, he was a president there from 60 to 63. And there you see his cabinet member in the background. So this is, this is a collage and a watermark slide where the major tragedy has been highlighted. In 1962, we had a famous uh, tragedy called as thalidomide tragedy, where the mothers who were taking these tablets for sleeping sickness, their babies, they developed what you call a seal limbed. This condition is called as phocomolia. It is a sickness where limbs were absent, nose was compressed. Then we had the jaws which were looking like this, babies and adults who were growing into, you know, uh, Down syndrome like babies. Uh, and this was a tragedy. Hundreds of thousands of babies across the world who took this tablet, thalidomide, were suffering from this. And this was detected only after four or five years of this tablet being marketed all over the world. The senator at that time called Kefawar, he was a you know a right hand man of family, uh, uh, you know the president John F. Kennedy. He he strongly fought against all the pharmaceutical companies in U.S. to ban them from uh, existence if they do not show safety and efficacy and quality of products. And this was a senator who's, who's such a great man. And that lady who I saw can be seen on the figure, her face can be seen in the figure number one called Frances Kaplis. So she was the, she became knight, she was later on honored by President John F. Kennedy with the highest honor in, uh, in US. And if you see the chronological order of the acts and regulation, you see light from 1902. There are various kinds of acts which have come into the picture until uh, 1990. And then now we are in 2020. There are new kinds of development in the regulatory area where things are becoming stronger and stronger and such kind of things are prevented. In India, unfortunately, the statistics are not uh, very clear. And because of poverty and uh, very poorly funded government hospitals and government uh, companies and uh, government agencies, we see still see a lot of deaths here, but they are not recorded. But this, we are talking about historical regulations, which have become as regulatory affairs now, uh, starting in US. So all these tragedies have taken place. You don't have to know in details right here. But it is just to know that there were a huge number of tragedies because before this regulation came into the picture. There are uh, regulatory bodies and major regulatory agencies all over the world who are trying to prevent uh, you know, major deaths in their countries. And individually in their countries, they are very powerful department of the Ministry of Health in their respective countries. Uh, in, uh, of course, on top is the list uh, is US where the, all these uh, historically regulations started. Uh, 
uh, also called as Food and Drug Administration. In the United Kingdom, it is called as MHRA. In Australia, it is called as TGA or Therapeutic Good Administration. In India, uh, because India is also a very recognized country in the regulatory field, so India is given of prime importance and uh, people are uh, uh, very respectful of India. Not so uh, in the 1970s and before that, when we were, you know, what, what our country was called as the least developed country or the LDC, the least developed country. But now we are a major power. India is a major power, which has got, it is a force to reckon with and one of the top countries in the world. And one of the area, besides other technologies in which we are well known, one of them is pharmaceuticals. So India is well known. So we are there in all the major bodies where uh, 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 drugs regulation have taken place in a prime way. In Canada, it's called Health Canada. Uh, and uh, the entire Europe, besides United Kingdom, it's called as European Medical Evaluation Agency. In Japan, it is called a Ministry of Health and Labor Welfare. So each country has got a different way of... Uh, and then there are different kind of bodies which are working across the globe in every country. One, the ones which I showed you just now are in individually country, they are regulatory heads. But across the globe, there are certain agencies because there is so much of poverty, so much of sickness, and so many people dying because of uh, poor health and poor quality of medicines where uh, unscrupulous people are uh, trying to make money out of uh, counterfeit and spurious medicines which are sold across the world. So there are agencies which looks after these things globally. These are the World Health Organization. Uh, you must have come to know that there are lots in picture now because of this pandemic. So they are working across the world with many countries to see that uh, all these uh, health uh, conditions along with the COVID treatment comes into the, uh, you know, for the benefit of the human in uh, as quickly as possible. Then in the Latin American countries, we have what is called as PAHO. Latin America has something like 35 to 36 countries, uh, starting with Mexico in the north, right down to Chile and Argentina in the south. In between are big countries like uh, Brazil, Colombia, and uh, we have the, uh, you know, various kinds of Ecuador and things like that, and Panama. So uh, all these things, uh, these, uh, these Department of Health, they work in the Latin American countries. Then we have World, World Trade Organization, and we have another important department, uh, well, another important council globally called as ICH, that is International Conference on Harmonization. So one side, the drugs are being discovered. On the other side, there is science which is describing this uh, drug research. And then there are third authorities, which are the regulatory authorities, who say whether the, the medicines which is discovered is fit enough for human uh, consumption in terms of its safety, efficacy, and quality, which I described earlier. So these are the global organization which tries to monitor the progress of the drugs for the humans. Then we have World Intellectual Property Organizations, uh, which deals mostly with the intellectual property organization uh, uh, property that is the uh, patents, the you know these uh, trademarks and uh, you know all this uh, other thing. Now coming to the regulatory affairs. Now this is coming to our main slides. Now uh, the regulatory affairs is a, is a, is a department after the, it was a necessity, it came very recently uh, in the early 80s. And then from 1990 uh, onwards, it has accelerated into a full-fledged department. And now you see that every pharmaceutical company has a regulatory affairs department. These are the uh, departments which deal with the, the products which are discovered from the company which it is made and then the regulatory authorities like what I just described in the last two slides. Uh, so this is a very important department which tries to link all the three 
stakeholders, that is the product, the company and the regulatory authorities. And this slide is, is quite a, a apt description of what a regulatory affairs person or the manager or the head of department goes through. On the one side, the pharma organization, now I've shown you how and what it takes to make a new drug and then how to you know, develop the drug into a form uh, which is consumable to the patients. So in the form of tablets, in the time, uh, type of capsules, in the, in the type of, uh, you know, uh, these uh, uh, injectables, in the type of uh, the creams, ointments, uh, which are the, called as the derma products. So regulatory affairs department goes into the organization, in every organization to see what do we have and how it is projected to the regulatory authorities. So he tries to bridge the gap between the pharma organization and the regulatory authorities for all its systems and products which this organization manufactures. So the pharmaceutical company now requires a regulatory affairs to do all this bridging of the gap as they call it. So they have to do this to bridge the gap between the you know what you call AC in a in a very uh, different terms I would say that in in the, in the city we have all these uh, you know uh, things which are going on uh, and now for the pandemic we see all these uh, you know for 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 all these authorities from the police and uh, you know what is happening in in uh, the rest of the India so these police officers they bridge the gap between the uh, you know the uh, the arm janta or the population and the uh, uh, the requirements and rules which the top government officials uh, for example in our case in india it was the prime minister himself who came during the covid times and he said that there are so many things which have to be followed when he first came in march and april and the ones which do these things are the, are the people from the, the you know, uh, departments like police. So regulatory affairs department is something acts like that, where it bridges the gap between the pharma organization and the regulatory authorities. So we come to the main subject now, uh, that is what is regulatory affairs? Regulatory affairs is a profession within the regulated industries. Uh, the, the, all these industries which are highly regulated are the pharmaceuticals, the nutraceuticals, uh, you know, these are sorts of, uh, uh, you know, uh, the capsules and tablets which are available, which are normally, uh, you know, which are available from uh, natural uh, uh, products. Then we have medical devices, the cosmetics, you know what is cosmetics, right? Like the cream, ointment, gel, which we use. These, uh, and when, when it is promoted for various kinds of uh, uh, dermatological uh, reasons, it is called as cosmetics. Then we have the FMCG products like consumer health products. Uh, and then we have the herbal products. Nowadays, a lot, uh, lot of focus is gone into herbal products. Uh, from you know even even uh, uh, these uh, patanjali's and things like that have come into the himalaya drug house they have come into the picture for uh, herbals and because the natural uh, the pharmaceuticals are taking its time to be launched uh, many people are now relying on, on herbals then we have these regulatory affairs even in veterinary products just like humans the animals you know, which finally the humans consume, like the poultry uh, and uh, these, uh, you know, these uh, other uh, animals which are like, uh, like the sheep and uh, the mutton and the chicken and all. These are all coming under the veterinary products. Uh, so these are, uh, these are also have to be uh, taken into effect. Uh, because the reason why is that humans consume these veterinary products. And that is why uh, the, there are special pharmaceuticals which deals only with the veterinary products. So regulatory affairs department is, interacts, like I showed you in the previous slide, interacts with departments within the company 
and the government health authorities. So, uh, regulatory affairs has got a very crucial role uh, in both these, uh, uh, you know, uh, linking the uh, gap between the industry and the ministry. The RA filter, RA filter means regulatory affairs filters. It takes all these kinds of regulations and rules which are necessary from the external sources, which the government first makes it, uh, and the world bodies, like I said, that the International Conference on Harmonization, now it is renamed as International Council for Harmonization, the World Health Organization, it takes all these things, it filters most of the things which are required and brings it back to the company. Uh, and, and there they, the regulatory affairs department evaluates, integrates, focuses, synthesizes, and disseminate, that is, it gives off to the stakeholders within the pharma companies. So a regulatory affairs department has a very crucial role. And when they are completed with all the following the rules regulation and they bring out a, a molecule or a new drug or a generic drug, which, is, uh, which has safety, efficacy, and uh, quality, it goes back to these bodies which, which regulates and gets its approvals. So a regulatory affairs department has got a very crucial role to play. And this is called as a regulatory wheel, you know, where so many activities goes on in a pharmaceutical company. This is a collage of different kind of activities which goes. So why is, why is pharmaceutical called as highly regulated? Because at every stage, the stage starts even before a, uh, a medicine is developed. It goes into the suppliers, then it goes into the, uh, you know the supply chain, then it comes into the uh, the pharmaceutical industry for development, and it goes through various stages, and then it comes out in in terms of marketing and distribution, supply chain, and to the various kinds of uh, people who require it, like the patients. So they have a various uh, kinds of uh, uh, you know activities which I have described as a regulatory wheel. Uh, they have post-marketing surveillance, R and D, well known. Everybody knows in the audience what is R and D. It's a research and development. Then we have seen the clinical phase where the, there is animal plus human studies, uh, and then there is this FDA phase where we have to submit it for registration. After the uh, after the FDA says okay. We manufacture the drug in large quantities. We uh, even the the regulatory affairs department even looks at how the product information is given on a on a you know uh, on a carton or on the inner packaging and an outer packaging of the medicine. You everybody has taken medicine. You know what is the inner packaging? One which is closest to the medicine. One, it is uh, termed in terms of strips and it is termed PVC, it is terms of alu alu foil. And then the outer carton, which describes what the medicine contains. Everybody knows what is the inner pack, outer pack, and we have tertiary package. When lots of uh, packs are, uh, uh, you know, again arranged in bigger packs or called the shippers or the master shippers, uh, the, we have different kinds of packaging. So every every of these stages have to go through the regulatory department. So regulatory department, by now you would have understood that it is really a big wheel of circle of activities. So manufacturing, labeling, advertising and promotion, it is done by the mostly by the product department and the marketing department. But it has to go all the all the all the information which is given to a doctor or a medical profession or a pharmacist in a pharmacy shop, it has to go through the regulatory scrutiny. It has to go through all these phases before the regulatory and the medical department of individual organization called as medical advisors and the regulatory heads. They sit together and decide whether, whether the message which is given to the doctor is correct in terms of its, uh, you know, uh, interpretation of how the medicine works and how it will relieve, give relief to the patient. So the language used by the pharmaceutical company to take it to the doctors, he has to go through the medical department and the regulatory department. So advertising and medicine straight away cannot uh, be 
going into directly to the doctors or to the medical or the health profession it has to go through this cycle then after that comes distribution we know that medicines the manufacturers sirs do not sell it directly but they have to go through the distribution sort of called as cfas the stockers the wholesalers the super distributors and finally the retailers and then it goes uh, you know to from distribution it can go through hospital network and then again to the patient from there then there are various kinds of reimbursement costs which have to be taken for uh, from the government for the various kinds of uh, you know health subsidies which is uh, given by the health government to the pharmaceutical organization and all these thing is called as a regulatory wheel so now you understand that regulated affairs department does so many activities and why it is important in a pharma company so uh, basically pharma regulatory affairs uh, the, it acts as an interface between pharma industry and the authorities across the world then it the main objective of the uh, you know regulatory affairs department is primarily for registration of drug products in all the countries but now we have uh, you know uh, with the coming of the one of the departments one of the global organization which i had uh, described to you earlier called as ICH with the coming of ICH they have made a uniform way of uh, submitting all the documents to only at one or two windows in the world so it does not have to go to during my time when i first started in regulatory affairs we had nearly about you know 150 or 200 countries where we had to deal with the ministry imagine the sort of a confusion we used to have with every language which is spoken differently in different countries so we also had to have an interpreter of the languages within the department but now you know uniformly they take uh, in the english language and then it has been made into very uh, very fast tracking and simplified in terms of electronic submission now we have what is called as a ectd or electronic common technical document so uh, that will be enough for dealing with majority of the uh, global uh, you know countries and there will be small things which we have to deal with individual countries but globally it can be uh, do from single point of view uh, but during our time we had to go to nearly so many countries to uh, if we wanted our medicines to be available in those countries so the most important thing was done by the regulatory affairs department you, now you can see the diversity of how this department is different so it deals with registration uh, it also deals with the various kinds of ministries yeah, and internally it deals with the departments in the organization called as drug development manufacturing marketing and clinical research i i gave you an example of how it deals with marketing by the way they write the script of how the medicine in terms of the literatures in terms of the digital marketing in terms of how they approach the Uh, doctors in her uh, in the visual aids so all this content which is uh, given the field force they cannot talk to a doctor unless it goes through the internalization of the scrutiny of whether that message given to a doctor is correct or not the regulatory affairs is actively involved in every stage of development of new medicine and i told you in that funnel inverted funnel so it goes through various stage of development so it is very strict so when a medicine comes into the market uh, it is not a straight forward uh, you know stage wise there is checks and balances at every stage in fact an analogy uh, something which uh, you know uh, which will uh, surprise you uh, i will give an analogy of uh, you know making a aircraft from the first component of an aircraft by a company like say boeing or airbus you know from the first stage to the last stage uh, till the the plane is airborne and it flies it takes only 4 years but a small capsule in analogy if we see from its transition from the first idea and discovery in the scientist mind uh, till the time it comes to the patient 
it takes something like 8 10 12 13 years can you believe the analogy but yes it it is something which is a reflective point where we can think that you know medicines are highly regulated you know uh, substances in the world now regulatory affairs provides expertise and regulatory intelligence into practical workable projects if there is a strong regulatory affairs it becomes very profitable to the organization because if they finish the entire fda and the regulatory process through perfect what is called as first time right documentation in all the things and they work hard to get things it will be launched into the market as early as possible if they get the regulatory approval after the science has been completed in the pharma organization so regulatory affairs department many pharmaceutical company they think it as a profit center instead of uh, expense center it is considered as a profit center so as a regulatory affairs department has got a high regards in in their respective organization it is respected if it the good science is documented and the medicine is passed at the earliest both the top uh, regulatory authorities as well as, as well as your pharma uh, company colleagues and your uh, top hierarchy in the organization like the chairman managing director and the uh, heads of uh, various department they respect your regulatory person because he has to have a thorough knowledge of the entire sequence of how the medicine comes from the discovery phase till the patient pays it it tries to bridge the gap so there is a justification for regulatory affairs department uh, because uh, in the world we see that globalization has taken place now it is not just when i started uh, you know we uh, india was uh, hardly in any of the nearby countries uh, uh, also we were only in uh, india but <coughs> when the decades started uh, maturing and the skills of the people and the output from the pharmaceutical industry is coming out successfully uh, we started first going into couple of countries nearby uh, smaller countries like even nepal and uh, sri lanka uh, and then uh, we went into nearby countries like bangladesh where bangladesh itself is a big uh, uh, pharmaceutical power now Uh, but other countries which do not have the wherewithal as they call it or they don't have the infrastructure and the resources most of them were depending on india so we are, we had to go to smaller countries then we went into larger countries then when finally we captured the united states and once we captured united states then the rest of the world recognized india as the powerhouse in regulatory affairs so globalization uh, made a lot of difference in the uh you know in the strides which india took in pharmaceutical company uh, in the pharmaceutical domain and uh, the regulatory affairs became powerful and so the, there was justification for a regulatory affairs department to be you know a uh, prime uh, center in any pharmaceutical organization then uh, the world is becoming stricter and stricter uh, for uh, newer requirements and newer guidelines and newer documentation practices so the, the regulatory affairs department deals with those uh, you know like i showed you the filter ra filter so it it filters all the unwanted noise which is there and then it only gives the correct information back into the company where they can fast track molecules and then give the correct documentation and then it goes back to the regulatory authority for approvals uh, then there is considerable difference in documentation requirements uh, and the way people communicate across the globe because there are so many countries so many languages so many uh, different way of writing things so many different way of understanding things so regulatory affairs department have to be in knowledgeable in all this they can't be language experts uh, but they can be you know uh, they know where to get the information so that is uh, for example uh, take the example of say canada now in canada uh, uh, there are uh, two uh, me, uh, there are three or four languages but the two major languages are spoken is english and there is also french so french is also spoken so every canadian uh, you know uh, what do you call uh, pharmaceutical uh, packaging and medicines have to be 
the labeling part has to be done in dual languages. So a regulatory person uh, has to know that this is what is happening in Canada. Then in Francophone countries, in, in uh, countries like Africa, they, they have their own indigenous language, plus they have the French language. In South Africa, fourth languages are speak, spoken. Uh, in India, fortunately, uh, there is uh, uh, one, and in some cases, two language, uh, that is uh, the, um, the Hindi, and then we have the English language. Majority of the labeling part is taking place in the uh, English language. So fortunately, uh, the, not much of confusion in, fa in, a, in uh, knowing the fact that India has so many different languages in different states. But there has been unification as far as uh, labeling uh, of pharmaceuticals are concerned. And just one language is dominant, that is English. Uh, but these the differences are, are to be known by the regulatory persons. Then the, all the guidelines, which are so many of them, have to be implemented in a current way. So now we come to the regulatory affairs department and how it has to be positioned and located. It's a department which is highly technical and digital oriented nowadays. And there are lots of, uh, during our time, there used to be lots of documentation practices. But now most of the regulated departments are controlled electronically and uh, there has to be these regulatory affairs uh, uh, trainees and um, uh, you know junior managers who report to the head of the department who is shown here and they have these computers in front of them because most of the documentation now is done electronically. So we have called as ECTD, that is electronic uh, you know, uh, uh, the documents. The, the whole team, mostly if you see in a project team in a pharmaceutical organization, we have a uh, top positions held by the regulatory department. And they work across, as you can see the four arrows here, they deal with every other department in the organization. So it's of prime importance for a regulatory uh, department in any organization. And they have to do deal with so many different kinds of documentation, uh, like site master file, drug master files, investigational new drugs, new drug applications, abbreviated new drug uh, application, then CTDs, uh, common technical documents, then FDA quality uh, question and answers, which FDA throws at you, at the company for any kind of uh, violation of the rules and regulation and the guidelines and the faults which are found in various technical uh, processing of the uh, you know the products then we have to deal with the fda for supplements amendments packaging and labeling and this is how a common technical document is uh, organized we have module one module there are five basically modules module one two uh, three, four, and five, and they deal with the various kinds of uh, documentation which are required for approval of a drug. So it's a huge process where, so sometimes uh, in the 1970s and in the 80s, uh, late 80s, when I, I was uh, in the regulatory head, we used to have one or two people in the department. Now, in some companies in India, they have nearly about 350 to 400 people in the regulatory department. So you can imagine wh what it has grown. The, this department, which was unknown in the 80s, have now become the topmost uh, department in any organization. So the, these are the various typical uh, regulatory affair job description. Uh, review, evaluation, compilation of files for submission, managing the information from various internal departments, preparing the various kinds of summaries for various kinds of... These summaries are not English language summaries, but it has, it's a technical and scientific summaries, which have things like status reports, graphs, charts, tables, various kinds of slides uh, the, for the submission to the uh, health authorities. Uh, then there is a review of the documentation. This is what a typical regulatory affairs JD is concerned. Uh, then it, it, it itself is like, a, you know, FDA to its own uh, company by saying this is right, this is wrong. 
and then the responsible timelines for completion they have to fast track it i had told you earlier that the regulatory affairs department can be profitable imagine a company which has millions of dollars globally in terms of revenue generation uh, and if they get 3 months time and 4 months time they can make profitable uh, profitability ahead of other companies which are slow in uh, making submission because everywhere you require permission for the for marketing to come into those countries the first stage in any country to uh, launch a molecule or launch a generic product or a drug is the job of a regulatory department once the regulatory appro approval gets from the country then the marketing people and distribution and other people get into those countries but before that it's the regulatory person so every country uh, the regulations has to be followed as quickly as possible so that every company tries to go into country faster than the other there is huge amount of competition at who can be the first in different countries so this is the job of a typical uh, regulatory affairs so now the career part which is the uh, one of the last of my uh, slides we have a different uh, careers uh, characteristics of a regulatory person how he has to have what kind of skills first of all uh, he has to have good communication skills he has to have like you like we saw this journey of so many uh, requirements he has to be multidisciplinary in his approach he has to have leadership skills means uh, he can take things forward in terms of his authority uh, where the top people in the authority uh, in the in the company give him that uh, responsibility he has to be multitask you said uh, yeah, like i said that in some cases he has to even probably know the languages uh, in the spoken in different countries Uh, an interpretation of the scientific uh, requirements uh, in different countries that also requires uh, you know leadership skills he has to be multitask he, uh, he has to have good time management skills like i had said that the faster they get into a country the more profitable it becomes he has to be diligent that means at the same time of the speed is required at the same time they have to be very careful in terms of morality and ethics uh in the way we present data called as data integrity this is very important uh in the initial stages india is to suffer because of data integrity we were shortcutting uh, all kinds of scientific documentation which fda never liked it. and later on when a uh, lot of multinationals came into india uh, we had these uh, we had lot of learnings to do from the multinational companies and then indian companies became stronger because they knew about what is integrity uh, what, what is the meaning of uh, ethics uh, what is what is the what is the correct way of uh, presentations of data how to communicate with uh, fda everything uh, you know a good regulatory person can actually do it uh, he has to be decisive take the right and the wrong decision at short notice mm. and then he has to have a commercial sense like in marketing the regulatory affairs i said that uh, where commercial means the where the marketing uh, people come into the picture marketing and finance the finance and the marketing people always want to earn revenue for the company uh, and regulatory person they look forward to a regulatory person to help them bridge the gap like i showed you the bridging of the gap they bridge the gap uh, to make things faster for the company and make profitability as soon as possible they have to be have social skill as well to be good with everybody around them to make everybody like a team player they themselves have to be a team player and they have to organize a team around them because you know so many things are required in a regulatory uh, you know domain that they have to be nice to everybody they cannot afford to have you know a uh, uh, wrong way shoulder is rubbed and uh, antagonize the people in various departments so that data has to come you see that is how a regulatory person has to have his social skills he has to be very proactive and forward thinking and like i said earlier he has to be a team player so this is all the characteristic of uh, regulatory affairs
Now the last two slides. <coughs> In conclusion, what does it say? Say future of regulatory drivers or future of regulatory affairs. Drivers means how to move it forward. How this. Regulatory affairs will be in future. How it will be driven and how it will go forward. Drivers means how to move forward. Now for India, fortunately for India, we are in a very enviable position. Uh, you know, only this small bad phase of pandemic has come in, but you know we were really going from in leaps, leapfrogging many things and moving into the next uh, era so fast. But the pandemic has put a lot of bricks. But anyway, in the next few months, we hopeful that we will be back in the driver's seat. India, in future, will have exponential growth in pharma. That is a prediction of most of the pundits in this area. And uh, our going away from China and relying on China is coming down to a great extent. Uh, and uh, we we are going to do all within the country and india has got that capability and in the last few months of uh, one of the industry which was open was pharmaceutical industries one of the first industries to move forward in fact in many places the pharma industry never closed they were operating uh, on a small uh, staff small basis but they were operating uh, that is what i call as the junoon of the pharma industry in India. Now, with the aging population, uh, leave apart this pandemic, but we, uh, the aging population is going to be the future drivers. In many countries, the aging population uh, <coughs> is, is uh, growing. So the youngsters are, but India is a young country. So, uh, but the rest of the world, you see, this is meant for the rest of the world. America, Europe, Japan, Japan has got a lot of aging population. So India has got a lot of potential for uh, exports to these uh, countries where there are populations are aging with medicines made for geriatrics and old age diseases, okay, like Alzheimer's and cancer and things like that. Then the, uh, the many, now you know with the pandemic, there is increased health and well, wellness consciousness. Now, people are uh, very conscious about their health and wellness. Uh, and, uh, you know, this is a scope for pharmaceutical industries to grow, bring out new technologies, new medicines, and keep the population in good uh, health, in fitness and wellness. So this is going to be a driver in future. And newer technologies are coming. It is already there in many pharma companies. Uh, and it is already, you know, uh, uh, in, in, even in India, it is coming. Yeah, it's just around the corner. It's, it's, it's going to come in any time now. We have artificial intelligence, machine learning. Uh, then we have uh, personalized medicine. We, 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 we will go into collecting large amount of data which are required for clinical science, uh, uh, which will be required on paper, uh, patient population. Data science, uh, the personalized medicine and 3D printing of various kinds of organization. Now you can, uh, I mean, various kinds of organs. Uh, now you can, you know, those people who have lost their nose, the ears, some internal body parts and digital parts like the fingers, uh, newer, uh, you know, contraptions are given uh, due to this technology which is coming into picture called as 3D printing. So these are the newer technologies which will grow, which will make... Uh, you know, the pharma industries and a lot of documentation will require when newer technologies come in and regulatory science will have a prime position. Then there are increased diagnostic capabilities, uh, which will uh, uh, just keep on leapfrogging in future and newer technologies and diagnostic method of uh, newer, newer types of diseases will be coming into picture where all these kinds of things are will be required. So, uh, like in my first slide, if you have noticed, I had made that this uh, department is a new world of knowledge. So, all of us need to keep educating ourselves. And isn't look looks like an exciting uh, future. So, be prepared for it. Uh, look forward in a very positive way. Definitely, we are going to march forward. 
so i thank you i thank nptel i thank uh, all those team members who interacted with me for making this presentation uh, i will uh, see if there's a answer, uh, question and answer session going on i uh, will just look into it uh, and then otherwise also uh, i have just given my contact details and just uh, let me know if i can be of any help in future so uh, all those who are looking and uh, aspiring to have a career kindly consider one of the one which i just mentioned because i know a lot of people from other disciplines have also come so i am not trying to compare one with the other i have just given what is uh, you know my uh, way of looking at what i was involved with for so many years so namaste jai hind thank you and wishing you all the best
Uh, can you see me? Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Uh, uh, hello, uh, my friends in the audience. Uh, uh, you know, there are about uh, <coughs> seven or eight questions, but out of which uh, three are very relevant to the topic which I have taken. Uh, and uh, I feel uh, that I will do justice and uh, give you the answers. Uh, hopefully, I don't know how, how much all of those who have asked questions are, are uh, you know, connected with the pharmaceutical uh, industry. Uh, now, the first question is from Adipta Pandey. And he says that he's from Gwalior. And he says uh, that uh, I'm looking at another computer now. Uh, what can be the low investment startup for a pharmacy graduate in India? Now, uh, the answer to this will be that uh, startup uh, of a pharmacy. So wh what does it mean? And that too, you're saying graduate. Now that pharmacy has got uh, four or five different types of uh, variation in its profession. One is that it is, uh, that we have B farm, and then we have uh, M farm, uh, PhD is there, and then we have farm D, which is doing with hospitals and clinicals. And there is a diploma in pharmacy, which deals with the, uh, these medical, uh, you know, stores and uh, pharmacy shops and uh, chemist shop, as we call it. So, uh, you know, each one of them, uh, you, uh, I don't know what uh, Mr. Adipta Pandey wants, uh, whether he wants to establish a pharmacy shop or whether he wants to establish distributorship or the supply chain or uh, whether he wants to have a pharmaceutical organization. Each one will have different kinds of uh, investment uh, potential. Uh, uh, and uh, the, the thing is that for pharmacy shop, you need an investment about uh, 25, 30 lakhs. Uh, for a distributor, you will have to have more than uh, you know, 10, 15 crores. And, uh, and if you have, want to have a pharmaceutical organization, uh, the minimum I would think is you will need about 50 to 100 crores. So these are the investment which will be required uh, and uh, it depends because pharma is such a huge domain. It's uh, not simple to, uh, you know, uh, invest. And initially you, you should be prepared for losing because uh, like I said in that funnel, you know, out of so many molecules, finally only one comes out because all of the other things are eliminated. So you should be prepared for big losses in the beginning. So try, try, try again. At least after that, you will succeed. That is, that is my, uh, you know, uh, advice. Uh, the second question is by Sonali Jagdish uh, Naste. Uh, she is from Satara. Uh, she has asked uh, a good question in a sense that uh, obviously she has got some pharmaceutical background, as I can see. Uh, why is US FDA regulatory authority, it is the most strict and stringent compared to our DCGI. Why this is so? The, you know, it is like uh, uh, in US, the rules regulation started more than 100 years back. Uh, regu uh, the way, you know, things were happening and they grew. So they had so much time to grow. In our case, we were basically we transited from uh, 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 local types of uh, herbal and Ayurvedic type of medicine into a pharmaceutical, which is considered as an English medicine. So we have a history of uh, something like uh, just of, uh, 40 or 50 years, while the uh, U.S. had a lead time uh, even before the 19th century. In the late uh, 18th century itself, they started... Uh, all these rules, regulation, guidelines, uh, and uh, their FDA grew from strength to strength, and uh, they got a lot of power. But while uh, we, uh, while in India, we were still trying to organize all our, uh, you know, departments and the health. And later on came the drug control department. Now we have the CDCO. Uh, that has taken place only after the, you know, maybe 90. 1990 onwards. So we have a history of just about 25 to 30 years or 40 years at maximum to be so powerful in comparison to US. Secondly, India were in only limited, first of all, it was only in India and limited countries. While FDA, US FDA had the global experience 
for so many years. So obviously they have become stronger and stronger in them. And to tell you, they have more than 40 or 50,000 people working across the globe. And they have so many laboratories and, uh, you know, these, uh, what do you call, uh, FDA departments in different countries. While India does not have, it only mostly has all its uh, drug control activities, uh, uh, you know, the department, the physical department was in India. So, USFT has a long history. So, uh, comparison-wise, it may not be in the uh, comparing, you know, it is like comparing oranges and apples. It's not apple to apple, a bigger apple compared to a smaller apple. That's how I would have put uh, this answer. Uh, the third question which I'll answer and then uh, maybe we can close because the others are all complimenting me and uh, uh, interesting topic and interesting lectures, all those things. The third question is, what are the guidelines for regulations of nutraceutical products in India? Basically, the guidelines are uh, normally the same because even uh, nutraceuticals have to be consumed by human beings. So anything which is consumed by humans, it has its own uh, guidelines and regulations. Uh, and uh, it uh, typically be, uh, behaves like a pharmaceutical. Uh, and But there are some, uh, uh, some kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, guidelines which are a little bit uh, uh, lesser intense than pharmaceutical. Uh, uh, like, for instance, the labeling part, uh, the labeling and all, and you can give colorful packs and your, your uh, description of uh, the medicines of how you got it. Uh, the scientific uh, scrutiny will not be so intense like in pharmaceuticals, which has got all these kinds of uh, animal studies and then it has phase-wise studies. So in, in uh, nutraceuticals, we have uh, um, uh, mostly we have the human clinical studies that too on the interest of the companies which do this. But if the ingredients in a nutraceutical uh, um, you know, uh, dosage form yeah, is from natural sources, then the guidelines slightly uh, differ to the uh, Ayurvedic type of guidelines or the herbal guidelines, uh, which our uh, many of our companies are also good at doing that. For example, Himalaya Drug House, uh, Himalaya Wellness now it is called, is uh, famous for all these nutraceutical products. Uh, and then there are various other products like Sami Labs uh, and Green Chem and things like that. So uh, that is how I would answer. So with this uh, three major questions which are uh, highlighted and given to me, uh, <clears throat> I'm, uh, if there are any questions, you can always write to me. Uh, you can also always collect my mobile number which I had given at the end of this uh, presentation and deal with me. So uh, thank you once again. I, I enjoyed uh, talking to uh, all of you. Uh, have a good future. Jai Hind. Yes. Hello.